Miami was taking on a Pistons team that had lost 20 of the past 21 games. Easy win, right? Not so fast, said the Heat, who blew an early 17-point lead and actually trailed the Pistons midway through the fourth quarter. That is, until Jimmy Butler checked in, scoring 18 points and carrying Miami to victory. Was Jimmy trying to send a message? And if he did, was anybody on the team even listening? We break down the game and answer your questions on today's Locked on Heat. You are Locked on Heat. Your daily Miami Heat podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. All right, welcome to Locked On Heat, your daily podcast on the Miami Heat. I'm Wes Goldberg, here with David Ramil. However you might be tuning in, YouTube, Odyssey, or your favorite podcast app, thanks so much for making Locked On Heat your first listen every day and for hitting that subscribe button. The Miami Heat beat the Pistons 118-105 to on Tuesday, and the story is Jimmy Butler, who after scoring just two points in the first half, went off for 18 points in the fourth quarter in the final six minutes. It was a closer game than it probably needed to be with 23 different lead changes, including a Pistons lead midway through the fourth. Uh, But my thought coming out of this one is that Jimmy was just playing with his food. Is that what you came away with, David? Absolutely. And that reminded me of uh, those videos of an orca kind of taking a sea lion and tossing it up in the air and saying, oh, we're not sure if we're going to eat yet. Maybe we'll just mess around a little bit more, torture the poor sea lion before we actually decide to devour him. Because Jimmy Butler actively trying to get everybody going. He had eight assists all in the first half, uh, just looking to get Gabe Vincent going or Bam or anybody. You know, go ahead. You guys win the game. You guys could do it, right? You've seen what I could do. We all know what I could do. I'm an all-NBA type player. You guys, you're still figuring it out. So here, you go ahead, mess around, see what you could do against these Pistons teams. Oh, nice. 17-point lead? Good, good. Keep up with the good work. Oh, you blew it. Oh, I guess you need me to come back. That's what it is? All right. All right. Check me back in, Spo. I'm ready. And that's exactly what he did. He went in there and just said, all right, Jay Nivey. Jalen Dern, whatever the hell your name is, all you guys, I don't even know. You probably won't even be in the league next year, but I will. I can still do this. I'm going to take over the game, and I'm absolutely going to dominate. And that's exactly what was necessary, yet unfortunate that Miami had to rely on Jimmy Butler to have this incredible transcendent-type performance late in the fourth quarter of a game that shouldn't matter and didn't matter ultimately, and yet That's the story of the season right there is that Jimmy Butler has to come and save everybody's ass because they're just not good enough to continue to win consistently, even against a bad team that was missing half their roster due to injury. And some made up injuries because they're blatantly tanking, (laughs) right? Some fake injuries. Um, The game was tied at 94 with seven minutes to go. Jimmy Butler subs in. He scores his first bucket at that point at five minutes and 57 seconds left, and he scores 18 points. In that final 557, going seven, seven, of seven, seven. yeah, <laughs> overall from the p- field. This wasn't quite Larry Bird just deciding to shoot left handed, but it almost felt like that <laughs> for a whole game. Like Jimmy Butler, he just kind of did whatever he wanted with the Pistons. And I think he knew maybe deep down that this game was never at risk of being lost, even though the Pistons yeah. led halfway through the fourth quarter. Yeah, I don't know. That's sort of my read on it is because. He had three steals in the first quarter, which is just insane. He didn't take a shot until the second quarter. He had just two points in the entire first half. Um, He had, what, eight assists in the game. He kind of just was doing whatever he wanted out there. It never felt like there was any sort of, like, interference between Jimmy Butler and the basket. There was never any friction in between what it is that Jimmy Butler wanted to do and what he was trying and what he ultimately did do. I I don't know. It's just, like, I would... I don't know that he was ever worried about the Pistons. Maybe you're right. Maybe it was sending a message like, hey, do I really have to do this? The answer, I guess, was yes. Um, And he did hit 18 points in in just under six minutes to put the game away. Only one field goal attempt in the first half. That's obvious that he's just like, no, I'm not going to shoot. You guys passing up shots. Yeah. Like it wasn't like like to the rim. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like, like we've seen it before. He gets to the rim and he's like, oh, wide open shooter. That's not it. This was like wide open at the rim. And he's like, no, no. Go ahead. I'm going to dish it off to you and see if you can finish at the rim or, or just pass it off. Maybe it's you know, it's going to be a swing-swing type play and you can get an open shot from the perimeter, but I'm not taking that shot. Only one. That, you have to be like – I think it was a shock, almost a shot clock violation that yeah. forced him to take a, a shot in that first half. Otherwise, he probably would have gone the full first half without taking a single field goal attempt. Do you think Obviously, that was the plan? Purpose- 
from his perspective, yes. I know Eric Spolster doesn't like it. Right. I can't imagine a world where Eric Spolster is like, Jimmy, I want you to kind of take it easy to see what, see how everybody else responds and you kind of figure it out. And it's just, it just feels like this is part of like a microcosm of sorts of the whole season is that Jimmy, there has to be some frustration with the rest of the team when he knows that he's so good and so capable. We've talked about this many times over the course of the season. Playoff Jimmy, MVP type Jimmy, all NBA type Jimmy. Like we've seen him at varying points throughout the season. And we know that he's been kind of taking his foot off the gas yeah. for a handful of games, especially in the first half of the season before the All-Star break. And but to do it, just kind of ramp it up. With but four games this- left in the season. Um, it felt like this game, they did open up a 17-point lead in the second quarter. And so maybe thanks part of Vincent. it is just, you know what? Yeah, thanks to Gabe Vincent. Like maybe part of Jimmy was like, well, you know, we're, we're kind of cruising here. And then the Pistons used a 17-1 to lead uh, that bridged the second quarter and the third quarter to actually take a lead in that third quarter. The Heat bout, the, the heat bounced back. They went on their own run, opened up a 12-point lead. And then again, maybe Jimmy was like, look, okay, okay. We, we, we survived that first run by the Pistons, and the Pistons right. made that other run and ended up taking the lead. And I guess at that point, Jimmy was like, I guess I got to take this thing over. <laughs> Maybe looking ahead to this back-to-back coming up, uh, or not back-to-back, but but the stretch coming up uh, Friday and on Sunday, I don't know like if that's part of it. I, seeing a, a Pistons team that's blatantly tanking and just feeling like, if I'm going to take my foot off the gas and maybe take a game, quote-unquote, off, maybe this would be the one. But hmm. he still played almost 36 minutes in this one. He took 12 yeah. shots. Um, and Although I, I did see him like points, but. before he was subbed out in the third quarter. I can't recall exactly at what point it was. I think he was getting to the free throw line uh, for one of his like, half dozen or dozen attempts or anything like that. But he like he got to the line. He didn't even look like he was sweating. I, I, this yes. is Jimmy Butler. We've seen him kind of. We know he's capable of these incredible physical exertions. We've seen him like pour his heart into a game. It was the third quarter. He was just kind of like, no, no, I'm that just kind of here doing tonight. No, not even the cardio. fourth. Not even the fourth when he scored seven yeah. straight or seven. Like, he went seven or seven points, from yeah. the line and just kept getting yeah. to the basket. There was a point yeah. midway through the fourth where I was looking at points in the paint. The Heat were down to the Pistons, 44 to 34. They were mm-hmm. losing the points in the paint. End of the game, What what's, what's the uh, points in the paint difference? Nothing. The Heat ended up with 44 points in the paint. The Pistons finished with 44 points in the paint. That was all Jimmy Butler. He just got to the okay. rim whenever he wanted and did not break a sweat, it looked like. Should his teammates, though, to go back to your other point about sending him sending a message, should Heat fans, should teammates, should all these people, should they be frustrated? Should they be upset with Jimmy that he's still kind of pulling this? Because I think part of this is Jimmy's hmm. personality is there is yeah. there is like this, this rebel without a cause kind of thing almost with him where he's just he's out there to just show you how good he is sometimes. In the weirdest, and he's not going to just do it by scoring 27 points. He's going to do it by all afternoon posting Instagram pictures of touring Winwood or whatever, or Detroit in this case, going to different yeah. coffee shops, eating donuts, like eating cookies, like all these things. He's like, I'm going to do all this stuff. I'm going to fill my day with tourist attractions, and then I'm going to show up to the arena whenever I want, and then I'm going to do whatever it is that I want to do on the court. I think that's just part of his mo, just in general, is like this weird rebellious. I'll show you ness. To him, and I'm not really sure why he does it, but I think it's a real thing. I can't recall the player's name, but I remember hearing a story about a player uh, in the ABA. So this was a long, long time ago that they couldn't. Oh, Marvin Bad News Barnes, that's who it was. They couldn't like find him. He was like notoriously hard to control, especially in the NBA that didn't have the same kind of level of structure in places the NBA and they couldn't find him for days. Not that they had like practices or games in between, but they just, he just didn't show up. And then all of a sudden he shows up in a fur coat and a bag of McDonald's, like a half hour before the game sat there, calmly ate his quarter pounder and then went out there and dropped like 50 points on the opponent because he was that good. And this was kind of like a shade of that, maybe not as overt, uh, and I can't imagine the size of the dog has that he'd be in with Eric Spolstra if Jimmy Butler tried pulling something like that. But at the same time, it's just it's a reminder that, yes, I am this good and I can turn it on whenever I want to. If there's a shred of optimism for Heat fans, it's that we could see this for a prolonged stretch once right. Miami goes to the play-in tournament or the playoffs or wherever they wind up falling. Because I just do think that this is a player – so clearly in his peak and yet able to turn it on and off whenever he wants to. And I, that's something I don't think I've ever seen before. This isn't like Michael Jordan didn't have an off switch. You know, Kobe Bryant didn't have an off switch. Dwayne Wade didn't have an off switch. But to see 
Jimmy be able to just switch it on and say, you know what, I'm not going to do anything for 48 minutes and then, or 40 minutes and then kind of just leave it for the last eight. That's pretty impressive stuff. I mean, Jimmy Butler steps up in a big way, delivers the heat this win, but another teammate does deserve some credit cookies. <laughs> We're going to tell you who it is next, but first, David, tell the listeners about our next sponsor. For a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. Is it the same when it comes to your vehicle? Yes, absolutely it is. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. Today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits right the first time around. Just add your ride to My Garage and look for the green check to know the part will fit or your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game. When you shop on eBay Motors and with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. Eligible items only. Exclusions do apply. Locked on Heat is available on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, so please do subscribe. It's a heat win, which means we're time. it's time to get in the kitchen and whip up some credit cookies, Dave. It feels like it's been a minute since we've done the credit cookies, right? Yeah, not, not, not a lot of winning there. Yeah. Uh, we didn't you know, do this, this after the Dallas win on Saturday. <laughs> the Heat have now won two in a row. What kind of cookies do we get to hand out? I, I'll be honest with you. I, I don't do a lot of research about the cookies here, but I was th- I was that really thinking. It's not at all midway, surprising to me. <laughs> midway through the fourth quarter, I was like, oh, this is blame pie all the way. Is there like a pie cookie? Because this is like the stink of blame pie mixed in there with credit cookies at the same time because this was just a really bad win i mean a necessary win i a guess moon pie a moon was a moon pie kind of a cookie I, I it has cookie in it right because it's the moon pie is moon the one pie it is yeah why moon not pies. all right moon pie cookies uh jimmy butler gets seven of them it feels be. like it could be more but there's another <laughs> player that stepped up in a big way in the first half yeah, no, I think seven cookies feels about right. Again, from everything we talked about, the ability to make an impact when he was out there. You mentioned the steals, the assists, the rebounds, almost all of those other stats coming in the first half when it was just like, oh, I'll do everything but score because that's up to Max Struess or Kevin Love or somebody else. Not me, not tonight. Uh, and then in the second half, turning it on like that. So, I, I mean, seven? I almost wish there was a way where he could be like, oh, I, I get seven, but I actually want to give you an extra one because – you know, I, I don't deserve it, or I, I don't know. I, I want to pass up the scoring opportunity for somebody else. But no, seven, seven, seven credit moon pies go to Jimmy Butler for sure. All right, that leaves three moon pies left, and it's got to go to Gabe Vincent. This might be a record for us because we're going to give three of them to Gabe Vincent. We're just we're distributing these credit cookies to just two players. I don't know the last time we've only done two players, but it kind of feels last time we did right it. Last about time it was, it was five and five for Jimmy and Bam, who both got an equal share of the credit. But uh, yeah. yeah. Gabe had, uh, you know, a fantastic night, especially in the first half. At one point, he had hit like five threes. He had five hard winners in his first 15 minutes. Yeah. Big reason for that 17 point lead early on. Yes, exactly. And that second quarter, he was a speaker. He looked like he was a little cocky, too. Like, not Mm -hmm. long in the release. He had the, you know, he would get the, the, he he would, uh, you know, a closeout would take place. He would do the one dribble, readjust. Pop it right away, let it fly. And he he hit a couple like that, and then one time he took one because he was feeling it a little bit and was completely wide left of the rim. So not a great. That's all right, move, but yeah, uh, that's okay. Guess he check yeah, hey, twenty two points on eight of fourteen shooting. He finished six of eleven from three point range. Everybody else, I mean, when you look at the three point shooting tonight, the Heat not shot great. thirteen of thirty six, so thirty six percent overall. Gabe Vincent responsible for basically half of Miami's made three pointers tonight. Everybody else, Max Struess, not a great night for him. Two of eight, Tyler Hero, two of seven, Kevin Love, one of four, including missing his first three. Kyle Lowry was two of five, which is about as good as it gets for Kyle Lowry these days. Um, so Gabe Vincent, if not for him, short rotation too. and a short rotation, they go with just eight uh, again, second night uh, or second game in a row that the that Spo going with that new kind of small ball rotation with Max Struess in for Kevin Love at sort of what we're calling the quote unquote power forward spot. But really, it's a three guard lineup. And they need to basically run running those three guards the entire game. And so Gabe Vincent plays 36 minutes in this one, right? And because he's getting so much time out there on the court. Jimmy Butler will say he's not listed at power forward and he's not playing power forward, but he's essentially the power forward, even though they had Max Strews guarding Jalen Duran for the first quarter, which was kind of crazy. Kind of. Uh, but that's what the Heat did. And Gabe Vincent 
made the most of Detroit's weak defense. The Pistons give up the highest field goal percentage in the league. And that's because guys like Gabe Vincent can go off against them. And because Jimmy Butler can just not miss a shot in the entire fourth quarter. Can we talk a little bit about Bam? Because he, yeah. he went basically, he went, he went almost two full quarters okay. without getting a rebound. The size was a big deal for him. It's a tough spot for him to be in given that he's the only big man on the court at, whenever he's out there for the heat against the uh, Pistons lineup that, that trends large, right? With mm-hmm. James Wiseman and Jalen Duran in that starting group. And Bam is not the biggest guy anyway. He's smaller than Wiseman. He's smaller than Duran in the first place. And so every time he was trying to go up for a rebound or get into the paint, there was two towers basically right. just waiting for him to, to battle with them. So a tough matchup for Bam. He still finished with 18 points, four rebounds, two assists, and two steals. So it was on 6 to 10 shooting for him, so 60%. So not a bad night for him, but just a tough one. We talked about Jimmy Butler kind of effortlessly scoring 27. Bam Adebayo really had to effort his way to 18 points. Yeah, he had six of those in the fourth quarter, too. So he was trying to be somewhat complimentary there uh, of Jimmy Butler late in the game. Uh, I think he kind of figured it out a little bit defensively against Wiseman in particular. He had a couple shots at the rim, too, that didn't fall. I know he was able to get to the line when those shots didn't fall. The Duran matchup seemed like it was a little bit more problematic because it was just like a matter of matching physicality against physicality. And it's not necessarily a, a, a matchup that Bam can win that easily because, as you pointed out, he's a little undersized. But it just looked like it was a night where, look, he came back from injury earlier in the game. In the day, uh, we were told that he was going to be available because of the hip contusion that kept him out the game before against the Dallas Mavericks. Uh, and, and he fell to the ground midway through the game. I can't recall exactly at what point he was fouled. Came crashing down. Looked like he hyperextended his knee a little bit. It's unfortunate he wound up having to play as many minutes as he did. Uh, and it looked like he was uncomfortable for a lot of that stretch anyway. It looks like he could probably use a break, especially before the play-in tournament. And with a back-to-back set coming up on Thursday and Friday later this week, he certainly could have used more rest. But alas, that is the Miami Heat season. Jaden Ivey scored 30 points for the Pistons tonight. Sure. Just talk about it? You and I both do the uh, the national, the Locked On NBA show. You, doing, you do it Monday nights for Tuesday. I do it Thursday nights for Friday. So you and I watch a lot of basketball. We've seen a lot of these rookies play. Jaden Ivey yeah. has really come along as the season has gone on. I really like him. Like those 30 points did not feel like empty calories, even though the Pistons would prefer probably that he's not scoring 30 points right now because they're actively trying to lose and try to get Victor Wembanyama. But in terms of like really quick rookie rankings, Paolo Bencaro, number one, I assume is the same yes. for you. But like where where is Ivey sort of in your top three, four, five? Like, you know, however you're kind of thinking about it. Probably top top four i would say keegan murray deserves some respect he's had a pretty good season yeah uh yeah i don't know maybe he's third best overall what about you where is he in your rankings i mean i've got uh the jalen on okc as my number two williams jalen williams on okc as my number two he's he's making a little bit of a push to win rookie of the year even though it's gonna be paul bancaro so i'd probably have those two guys you're one and two uh Benedict Matherin's nice, but he's kind of one-dimensional. Where Jaden Ivey, tapered I, off I like too. his, and he did taper on Jaden Ivey. Is like he also had what eight assists tonight. Like he makes quick yeah. decisions. He has like this funess to him. He's not scared. Not that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I really like that. He kind of reminds me of a little bit like Anthony Edwards in the way that he carries himself a little bit, and that like he thinks I that he it. belongs out there. There's a confidence that exudes from him, and I really he, think he was talking important. smack to Gabe too. Like yeah, it seemed like that was that little. That's important there. stuff in the NBA, right? Like especially when you're young and you're trying to make it. It's on a bad team. Like the more he's 19, the better. Yeah, and he's not gonna get punked by Gabe <laughs> Gabe Vincent. So I mean, good uh, for him. I really like him. Um, there's something Jimmy Butler is better at than anybody else in the NBA. <laughs> We're going to tell you what that is next. But first, David, tell the listeners about our sponsor. It's not coffee, although that's a possibility. But anyway, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. The NBA Sports playoffs. Out of the NBA, so. <laughs> are almost there. Well, his was an espresso maker in the stall. Yes. I, I would have loved I never got a chance to see it, and that's a regret of mine. I never got to see the espresso maker in the stall, in the changing room there, in the dresser. I mean, that would have been pretty impressive. But anyway, now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's a bonus bet back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, super easy to use, quick payouts. You can bet on everything from the money line, the point scores, the number of threes drained, uh, you know, who knows what uh, Jimmy Butler will do in the fourth quarter next game. But you can always place an easy bet that way because FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. So don't miss a chance to get your no sweat first bet. Again, one up, up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, 
an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Reach Locked On Heat on Twitter, Instagram. You can email us, lockedonheat at gmail.com. Thank you to everybody who sent in questions on Twitter for our post game show using the hashtag AskLOHeat. This first one comes from our friend TZA Mac, who writes in Is Jimmy the biggest troll in the NBA? David, going back to the T's going into the C block here. I think this is what Jimmy Butler is better at than almost anybody in the NBA. And I think maybe the only competition he has might be his old teammate, Joel Embiid. Is Jimmy the biggest troll in the NBA? Hmm. Yeah, not not the same way in, in that Embiid is... I think he uses social media a little bit more for his trolling. It's more about but jokes. Less, less lately for Embiid. Like this season, I've seen a little bit less well, of the social media stuff from Embiid. It's not, he's trying not to piss off the MVP voters. That, that's the yes. thing that's different for me is that Embiid is much more of a... Well, I'll say, I think he's a, a big baby. And I think that it's just the way that, you know, he, he wants that attention. He, he wants definitely that. cares about what everybody thinks. And there's a big yes. kind of like a woe is me thing. He's like, I don't know what else I have to do to win MVP. Yeah. I actually think the public is pretty fair to Joel Embiid. Like, I don't think as many losses public, as yeah. the Sixers have had in the playoffs, yes. I don't really think people blame Joel Embiid for that the way that you know, James Harden was blamed for the Rockets' failures, or even Nikola Jokic to a degree with the Denver Nuggets. I think people are pretty forgiving for Joel Embiid, considering how big of a superstar he is. Yeah. How and, and how we treat most of our other superstars, Kevin Durant, Kyrie, like all these other guys. Like I think Joel Embiid kind of gets away with a lot, and he's pretty likable in that sense. And I think that's why. Uh, but the troll, not for you, but the the trolling thing, <laughs> I, I that kind of is the difference to me is that Jimmy Butler genuinely does not care. I think what other people think. And it goes back to what we were just talking about personality. at the top of the show, where he almost actively wants you not to like him in based on his actions. It's like, again, just going out in the middle of the day, doing all the things that are sort of in a cliche way, what we don't expect our athletes. To, people expect their basketball stars to be like, okay, you work, you go to shoot around in the morning, get your nap in, in the afternoon, get eat, eat some pasta. So you got your carbs and get ready for the game. And that's your day. If it's a game day, that's your day. Just lock yourself into a hotel room and get ready for the game. And Jimmy Butler is kind of actively spitting in the face of that. And he's like, I'm just going to tour about town, do my own thing, ride bikes. I don't care. I'm just going to play tennis. I'm going to do all that the day of the game. And then I'm going to go out there and do what it is that I do. And, yeah. and I kind of think he's actively trying to get people not to like him. And, and that is sort of the definition of a troll. I guess that's fair. Uh, you know, I, Jimmy is, uh, like I said before, what, perhaps the most interesting personality in the NBA. Uh, like, mm. just you never know what to expect from him. I have broken decorum in, in the interview room a number of times just because I find his dry humor to be so hilarious and it's so, like, scathing. And it's like, he's, he's I, I don't know, self-deprecating at the same time, but it also really, like, Sticking it to others, he just doesn't mind that. It's just—it's so funny the way he interacts with people, and it's just to think that so many people dislike him across the country. I, I think again, the peripheral fan only knows about him, Rachel Nichols, problems in the locker room, you know, breaking up the Minnesota Timberwolves, whatever problems he out, created. Getting out of Philadelphia, you picked yeah. the bias over me, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but even that's hilarious. That's a troll. That I mean, he is trolling. He he, he knew the cameras were there. He knew yeah. Tobias would hear it. He knew all of that stuff. And uh, I think he is. I think he's the best troll in the NBA. I do think that Joel Embiid was giving him a run for his money like a couple of years ago. I thought Joel Embiid yeah. was really, really good. But like I said, he's kind of tapered off a little bit. He cares a lot about what the outside perception of him is. And Jimmy Butler has almost leaned more into it. I mean, the the the, the dreadlocks uh, and, and the extensions right. on during media day – just in order so that his <laughs> just so that his picture could be that for the rest of the season and it doesn't even look like him anymore, right? right? He even shaved his face for that too. And he all and he just grows the beard back so he doesn't even have like the baby face thing going on anymore. So is he the biggest troll in the NBA? Absolutely. Let's get to this next one. Uh it kind of slipped in to the mentions here while the Heat were letting their lead slip away. But this one comes from at Heat We Go. He writes in how much blame does Spo deserve for this season drama? He stopped adjusting. During the games, uh, full transparency. I almost just didn't even want to answer this one because I'm kind of, yep. first of all, the heat won. This one came in during a heat loss. I understand a lot of questions come in when fans are frustrated. So maybe at heat, we go doesn't even want this question answered anymore, but I have the feeling that there are a lot of fans who still want to blame Spo for the way that the season has gone. And on a night where you 
you come, you win comfortably against the Pistons, but it didn't feel that comfortable for as long as it probably should have felt comfortable either. So what do you think? Yeah, I, I don't know what Spo could have done differently tonight. He couldn't have like said to Jimmy, knock it off. We need you to score now. Like maybe he could have, but you kind of risk and you know, you can't, you risk pissing off Jimmy right before the postseason. I don't think you necessarily want to drive that wedge there. And again, it's not like Jimmy wasn't being impactful. He just wasn't scoring, wasn't trying to be aggressive. And it didn't matter because Miami had built a 17-point lead. So there's only so much he could do. And by the way, we don't know that that did not happen. We don't know that when Jimmy Butler checked yeah. in with seven minutes left in the fourth, if Spo said something like, hey, take you ready? home Turn first. it on, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. yeah. Take it home. Um, so that's absolutely a possibility. Aside from that, we, we, you and I were talking about this before we started recording. Like he's made a ton of adjustments throughout the course of the season. How many different starting lineups, benching Kyle Lowry, benching Kevin Love, you know, starting Kyle Love, uh, starting uh, Cody uh, Zeller, you know, starting Caleb, starting uh, benching Caleb. Like he, he has tried and changing defensive with the schemes. It's not just lineup stuff either. Like it's it, it's playing the most zone in the NBA basically ever since we've been tracking that data for the first half of the season and then just being like and just and then just crumbling it up and throwing it in the recycling bin for the second half of the season and playing absolutely right. no zone tonight right they, play uh, they they played a little bit but they also played like old school big 3 uh help and blitz style defense right. too every time Ivy came off of a screen or even Killian Hayes would come off a screen they'd try to force the ball out of his hands like there's a lot of different defensive techniques that this team uses, a lot of different looks, a lot of different kinds of things that they get to. Offensively, the system has changed as well from basically a, a raining mid-range shots over and over again to trying to remove that part of the shot diet and just get to the basket and create more three-pointers. This team has gone from shooting 28 threes a game to shooting 40 threes a game to going back to shooting 28 threes a game. Like there has been so many adjustments this season. And my thing too is not even going beyond the adjustments. The where the frustration comes from is the fact that the Heat aren't winning as much as people would want them to win. Right. And my answer to all of that is, what is Spo supposed to do with this <laughs> roster? It's not as if, and I say this all the time, it's not like Kevin Durant is sitting at the end of the bench and Spo is refusing to use him. I think he's getting the most out of this team. I don't know that there's a coach that could do more with this team than Eric Spolstra. Okay, my counter to that, and I don't, I agree with you. I'm not necessarily. I'm playing somewhat of a devil's advocate here. We Go saw ahead. the we saw the point recently from Tim Legler appearing on the JJ Reddick's uh, Old Man in right. the Three podcast, complaining. You know what the, what is the Heat doing about Duncan Robinson? And I think it was a good point. If you haven't seen, I think Ira Winterman wrote up something about Legler's comments. You can always go and check out uh, Legler's appearance on that podcast too. He was asking about Duncan Robinson. And he's saying, "Look, you paid him." And then you've basically taken him out of the rotation. And, and we all know what his limitations are defensively and everything else like that. But if you've got one of the best shooters on the planet, I still think Duncan is that. And we've seen evidence mm -hmm. of that, even though the shot hasn't been falling as consistently at, at the same historic levels as he once was on shooting at. Like, he's not capable of getting into a rhythm at this point of the season. Right. You've basically broken his spirit, broken his confidence. It's not easy to rebuild your way back from that. And that kind of does feel like that's on Spo to a certain degree, especially for a team that's one of the worst yeah. in the league in three-point percentage. I think that's a great topic to dig into on tomorrow's show because I oh. think that I think that needs a whole segment, and we're we're coming to the end oh. of this one. So how's that for a tease? Tune in tomorrow. We're getting to get into the whole Duncan Robinson thing. For now, thanks again for making Locked On Heat your first listen every day. Remember to subscribe to new episodes of Locked On Heat on your favorite podcast app and on YouTube. Hit the like button right now and make sure that you are subscribed for our recaps of every game going into the play-in tournament and then hopefully the playoffs after that. Oh. Now make your second listen. Game to Game NBA, every moment, every top performance, every result locked on Game to Game covers every game from across the NBA with local analysis that only Locked On can deliver. Follow Game to Game on Locked On NBA. It's available on the Odyssey app, YouTube. It's wherever you get your podcast. Also, if you missed it, Check out our exclusive interview with Michael McCullough, uh, Chief Marketing Offer Officer of the Miami Heat, breaking down everything with the new Kaseya naming rights deal. You're not going to want to miss that if you're interested in all in the business side of sports and naming rights deal, or what to even call this new Miami Heat arena and how this is different than the FTX deal. You're going to want to check that out. That's up on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. David, thanks for joining me. You got it, Wes.